Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the first ever Industry Tech Days presented by All About Circuits. I'm Dave Finch, host of Moore's Lobby, the podcast by engineers for engineers. Uh, today is Wednesday, September 2nd, and we are kicking off day three of what has been a refreshingly useful conference so far. Um, I got to say, editorializing here, this event is blowing my mind, and we're not even halfway through the week yet. Uh, on Monday, we spoke with the founder of Free Artos about edge computing and the Internet of Things, specifically the realities facing uh, engineers in these designs. And then yesterday, we had the MIT electrical engineering professor and CEO of edX, Anand Agarwal, took us all to school on the topic of online learning and its massive importance to the engineering community. And today, well... Buckle up. <laughs> we are uh, kicking off day three, very much like a Formula E qualifying round, uh, fast and electric. Our keynote speakers today are none other than world champion Formula E driver and Audi Sport and Robo Race board member Lucas DeGrassi and Robo Race's chief strategy officer Bryn Balcom. All right, let's uh, let's dive in here, guys. Uh, welcome uh, to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Um, pleasure being here. Really excited to talk about uh, racing cars, electric, and uh, an autonomous future. Absolutely. Yeah, likewise. Thanks very much, Dave. Yeah, it's, it's really an honor to have you. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, you know, when it comes to automotive electronics and innovation, the current electronics industry media, in my opinion, seems to love nothing more than hyping a few topics that have become almost like crutches. Uh, these would be 5G technology, autonomous vehicles, sensor fusion, and artificial intelligence. And a, a lot of writers get it totally right, and it's, and it's really great content. But I feel like when a tech journalist is having a rough week, you know, he or she can just pen a quick article on any one of these topics and feel as though they're making some kind of uh, contribution. And I'm never convinced that it even means anything to the engineers that they claim to be writing for so uh for like more than a year now probably i've basically ignored these types of stories when they show up in my feeds and then along comes robo race easily one of the most exciting if not the most exciting endeavors gaining traction in automotive today in my opinion uh from an engineering Thanks. standpoint it's it's real it's grounded it's here and now research and development that is going to accelerate the viability of things like AI, advanced sensors, 5G connectivity, and even things like next generation battery technologies in automotive applications. Um, you know, clearly the work that you're doing right now has massive implications to the consumer automotive uh, electronics industry, and this is what people should be paying attention to. So, um, Lucas, uh, until recently, you were CEO of RoboRace. And um, I, was, I was hoping you could start us off today by explaining what RoboRace is. Um, Dave, the, uh, I'm a racing driver. Um, uh, my dream when I was a kid was to, to drive fast cars, but very quickly I saw that um, the automotive, the, the motorsport, actually uh, serves as an R&D, um, as, a, as a research and development platform for commercial vehicles. And nothing, um, nothing comes more uh, to my mind as a, as a future endeavor than having driverless vehicles, electric, uh, going safe, fast, and cheap around cities. So when the founder of RoboRace, um, uh, Dennis Verdlov, invited me to be part of the of the of the series at the very very beginning uh, to help to develop the car to help to to be more as an advisor um i was very pleased very honored i joined robo race uh, in more or less beginning of 2016 and then i was following the roots of robo race together with Brina also and then in 2017 then he said look uh, lucas why don't you join a ceo I'll be very. I will be running the company very close to you, and and helping you to uh, to make this series become whatever you and Brin decides in terms of a of a strategy of the future. How how do you think is the best way to attract talents, to make it worldwide um, uh, known, and to accelerate? So the the, the base of Roborace is to have a top down approach to accelerate 
the, um, the technology around driverless vehicles is to find that ultimate algorithm that will be faster than any driver at any conditions anywhere and then scale it to commercially scale to commercial vehicles and then use that also uh, because it's a racing series because it's exciting to use that as a promotion um as a as a the same way as we did with formula e to change people's perception of how good the autonomous vehicles can be so if you see um if you see cars going at uh, 300 kilometers per hour inches or centimeters from each other with a very very high precision um and doing it better than humans i also believe that the the, the acceptance of society would be much better for autonomous vehicles so you have the r d and perception are the two key elements that why RoboRace exists in the same way as F1 has done in the past, accelerating safety and other technologies. The future is autonomous, so we have to develop the safety, the R&D aspect, uh, aspect and, the, and the perspective of the society towards an autonomous future. Absolutely. That's, um, and, it's, and it's a fascinating uh, undertaking. Uh, and I'm curious about the allure of robo race to a professional driver such as yourself, because <laughs> on the surface, it might appear that you're effectively designing yourself out of the car, but there's probably more to it than that. Yes. My, my colleagues, um, normally they say I'm, um, I'm a Turkey, uh, cheering for Thanksgiving day, uh, <laughs> because, because, <laughs> because, you know, you're going to make us all unemployed. And I was, and I'm like, look, autonomous cars, we're going to make us unemployed, all, all of us unemployed anyway. Right. Um, but if we manage to accept it, develop together with motorsport, maybe we can use this instead of just like saying, no, I'm not going to look like in the, let's say, 90s. I'm not going to look in the online commerce. This is something else. Or, you know, or Kodak. <laughs> I'm not going to look into digital film. And then... A few years later, you're dead. What we're trying to do is actually what I'm trying to do is first use my knowledge and my expertise that I helped that I helped create Formula E and try to find a transition way to Robo Race to become a worldwide known series, uh, but also try to implement in a, in a in a very specific way that we can separate the technology that is is important for autonomous vehicles and really focus that into Robo Race and leave the other side of motorsport very human centered. What are, the analogy that I use is that it's not because Deep Blue, um, the supercomputer from uh, IBM, beat Kasparov in chess in the 90s, that people don't play chess anymore. Nowadays, right. even any, 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 any app, you can, if you want to play chess against any app, there is a almost like 100% chance you're going to lose if you, if you try to play even in a, in a phone no, nowadays. Sure. But uh, people still play chess against each other. You want to see who is the best player. And I think with motorsport, it's going to definitely happen something like this. People still want to see which, which is the best driver, the most skilled, the most brave, the ones that can uh, ri uh, drive the best car in the, be in, the, in the worst conditions. But eventually, uh, the, the computer will be better at, off than any driver. And then I dream at one future that even you can combine both. I could imagine the 24 hour of Le Mans, an endurance racing. Um, or the most extreme endurance race in the planet that you could do one stint. So one part of the race purely autonomous and the second part, a driver. So it's a combination for the manufacturer of a driver driving a, a one part of the race and the computer driving another part of the race. And for the amateurs, um, having a, a, an AI assistant, so having an AI coach, uh, that can help the driver to achieve its limits in a safe way. And even for supercars of the future, it will, when you buy a supercar, it will come, I hope, with a robo race based algorithm uh, or AI that can help you to have fun with your supercar and at the same time be sa being in a safe side. So that, that, that's, the, that's, what I, that's how I see it. And that's why we did season alpha which is what we're, uh, we're calling it the, the first season that we did last year with RoboRace with the competition. Um, and then calling it this season, which is, was kind of changed because of the, of course, of the COVID situation and all the, uh, the problems we had, but it's still happening. Season beta, before we go to season one, 
which will be, um, let's say, next year or uh, second semester of next year, uh, to really have the teams competing in a, in a very high level. We are talking about only uh, now around 3% left time. I even have a bet against the owner of RoboRace, against Dennis, that we're going to actually try in October now. That is always we do it every six months, me against the, against the car. So to see how the algorithm is evolving. So wow. it's, we started about 2018 to 20% slower, which is pretty slow. But now it's only 3%. And that was like a year ago. So I'm really looking forward to see, uh, we call it a singularity, when, the, when the, the AI is able to beat a professional racing driver. Yes, absolutely. I, um, I, I'd, I'd weigh in on that bet. <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of time it's just a matter of time uh, <laughs> that's that is fantastic and you know the what i love about what you're saying too here is is um it can be man and machine it doesn't have to be either or they're not mutually exclusive and the advancements uh, when you solve problems for autonomous vehicles you're solving problems for all mankind you're solving problems for all of us Every car will improve when we can, like you said, um, achieve a car that will drive 200 miles an hour inches apart from each other uh, safely, no crashes. Uh, it, it's, all, uh, it's all upside, in my opinion. Yes, th there was actually a study uh, in the U.S. The cost, also, the cost will go down. So it will be a democratic way of creating uh, much better mobility. There are two aspects. First aspect is when you take a taxi, about half of the cost is the driver, uh, even a little bit more. Depends on how you go. In the U.S., it's even more. In a mm. developing country, it's a bit less, but depends. But around uh, two thirds of the cost of, a, of when you go when you take a Uber or a taxi is the driver. So when you take the driver out of the equation, it becomes very very cheap. You cannot compete only with hardware. So that's why there is this race towards automation. Because everybody wants to be the first one, and the first one gets more data, is exponential growth. So the first one dominates the market, dominates mobility. It gets cheaper. Second, uh, when you buy a car today, when the average American buy the car today, 95% um, of the time, the car stays still somewhere, parked somewhere, either at your home, either at work. So it costs real estate space. It costs you, it's a, depreci a depreciating asset that you put a lot of money. Actually, normally cars are, the second biggest um, expenditure um, uh, a normal person has after their house is the car. So it's a depreciating asset that you, now you're buying it, it stays 95% of the time parked, depreciating value with time. It's not going to be like this anymore. You're going to ask for a, a, a you, you need to go somewhere, you request an autonomous car, it picks you up and drives you somewhere and then picks somebody else up. So you're going to be driving. So we're going to be a, a much more, a uh, smart way of using the resources, using the, the materials, using uh, everything that is needed to, to, to compose a vehicle. That's why the race is so important. And that's why even if we are in, in early terms with, um, without, with uh, early in a way, there is already autonomous cars, but in level five massification of usage mm -hmm. that you go from your farm to, your, uh, to the door of uh, somebody in, a, in another city or you or you go in a car and you sleep and you wake up in another state or in another country. Um, this is a bit far away, but um, the, the, the first steps of automation, which are closed lines of buses, which are airports, which are um, um, any kind of already predetermined route in, inside a, a city, this is already existing and this is already uh, there. And everybody's having a bottom-up approach. So everybody starts with very slow cars, trying to figure out what to do. Tesla, of course, has their approach with computer vision and collecting massive amount of data. We decided with RoboRace, let's start. So what's the most difficult thing for a, a driver is to drive in a racetrack. Let's start from the, what is the most difficult and then bring it down to the, to the, to the commercial vehicle. Absolutely. It, it all sounds so awesome to me. Um, and, and, you know, while we're talking about technology advancements and all the things that you know that have to come together for this to be a reality Bryn um why is the electric vehicle powertrain suddenly getting so much attention nowadays 
Yeah, I think obviously Lucas is kind of more of an expert in this area than me. So yes, within RoboRace, we use a fully electric powertrain. Um, for cities around the world, clean air, and Lucas is a UN ambassador. Uh, in that regard, it, it's incredibly important. You know, I think the number of lives lost just through clean air is, is, is substantial, Lucas, every year, if I'm correct. Yes, so, uh, about, about, four, about 4 million a year people, according to the yeah. uh, UN report, yes. Oh yeah, gosh. so just for clean air in cities, I think that becomes really important. And then there are obviously then the, the benefits that lead towards CO2 emissions, you know, depending on where you're sourcing your electricity from in the first place. And I think that's always the big question is where you get your electricity from. Um, but in terms of like sport and performance and competition, the, the key thing that we have in, with the robocar is we have a unique ability now with electric powertrain to have four independent electric motors within the vehicle. So, you know, if you look at Formula One, even if you look at Formula E, which is fully electric, there's only one motor. And then you have to differentiate, you know, you have a differential to distribute that power. With RoboRays, you can control the power at each wheel at any moment in time. So the level of vehicle dynamics control that you have is a significantly higher. And so the performance you get from that, or really in the future, the safety enhancements that you get from that is really important. And I think... It's certainly a position I know Luke has been advocating on for Gen 3 Formula E is kind of to put in that direction of having multiple motors on the vehicle. Uh, it reminds me, and correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm interviewing two people in racing and I should know this, but I'm not sure <laughs> that I, I uh, if I remember correctly, Audi was the company that came along and introduced all wheel drive on the racetrack, completely revolutionized. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. In and rally. So we're in rally. Yeah. In rally. Okay. So, and now we're talking about an individual motor on each wheel, not just all wheel drive. And, um, and this is exactly the kind of technological advancement that you're talking about, uh, a rising tide, so to speak, that's, that's lifting all ships. Is it fair to say that Robo Race um, is an incubator for emerging technologies such as this? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly why our founder, Dennis, sort of set it up, you know, is to, is to look at how you use motorsport to advance that technology. And, and you, you have to have that competitive element, you know, in order to push the boundaries of technology. And then how you structure the rules and regulations are the things that shape how that technology evolves and how it improves. So, you know, we definitely talk about, you know, low-level torque vectoring is one of the things. Obviously, the compute and the sensors that go into the vehicle is another layer. And then above that is the software that's connecting to those sensors and processing and doing the driving. So those three areas will really define your ultimate performance of, of your vehicle platform. Absolutely. Um, you know, and it strikes me, Bryn, that we haven't seen uh, a true automotive evolution since the early days of uh, combustion engines. So what, maybe like 100 years? And now we've got uh three major catalysts for true evolution in this industry, artificial intelligence and the associated hardware, yeah. vehicle electrification across the board, and thriving uh, open source ecosystems. Um, of these three catalysts, uh, where do you see, do both of you see the greatest bottleneck or barriers to progress? Yeah, I'm not sure if, if there are, let's say, barrier progress. I think all of those are enablers really so the open source community especially around let's say robotics and in the future if we look back on this dave in the future you could just look at automotive as being a a, a vertical within robotics you know robotics is actually the larger domain that will use all of these technologies Aut you know, autonomous vehicles are just one subset of the type of robots that we're going to be experiencing and so there are some great open source robotic frameworks that are out there and certainly some of the teams that compete within RoboRace are already utilizing those, you know, just to speed up their development process, for example. So I think there's actually a lot more enablers now, even compared to four years ago when we launched. There's a lot more that's existing now that can accelerate these technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how about uh, the rest of the vehicle? Uh, the like, for instance, uh, batteries, uh, you know, the. It seems like um, it seems like the battery is something that um, has been evolving and uh, and maybe is, is there is there 
kind of a catch up period that we're experiencing with with battery uh, technology right now, or are we are we approaching, um, you know, revolutionary new technologies where you can complete an entire race uh, and not have to worry about charge and that sort of thing? Yeah, I yeah, think I'll, this is I'll, definitely Lucas's technology. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I was gonna say is. Yes, uh, 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 for me, the, 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 we're talking about bottlenecks or constraints in development. And for me, the battery is the biggest uh, of all. Um, it's actually not battery per se. It's actually energy storage and energy deployment, uh, which in this case, electrical power needs to be stored some, somehow um, in, a, in, in, a, in a battery or a supercapacitor or something like this. So for me, batteries are evolving quite slowly. There is a lot of... Um, there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of uh, uh, companies around with solid state um, uh, solutions with uh, lithium air, with other solutions coming along with gra- graphene batteries. But this is for me the, the biggest constraint. But, but the, the, there has been some good evolution, especially in the pricing of battery, because for, for it, for everything that we're talking about from um, uh, AI, processing power, 5G, electrification, for to, to be massified as a, as a commercial product, you need to have the right price point. And that's why um, we have this convergence. We've seen the price of battery coming down. We've seen the, the processing power uh, going up. We see the connectivity going up. So you have more data available, you have better sensors, you can process it better. Artificial intelligence, machine learning gets better. And then it can deploy in a, in a much better way into an electric powertrain, which is basically an electric motor and, and a battery. And uh, Formula E was a perfect example of it. When Formula E was created, I was very, very much involved in the, in the creation of Formula E since the very beginning. Um, I, am, I was employee number three of Formula E, and I saw the, the evolution of, of the series. We had to go with two cars per race. So we needed to do a 45, 50-minute race for TV, but there, there was not enough. There was it was impossible with the, let's say, with the performance requirements to do everything with a single car. So we decided to do for the first time in motorsport, a race which the driver, instead of in the pit stop, change the tires and refuel, the driver would jump out of the car, go to the car B, let's say, jump out of car A, go to car B, and then go again after half of the race. And uh, in only three of, in only four seasons, so four years, we managed to double the, the energy capacity in the battery and go to a single car. So today we have about 25 to 30% more power, uh, more performance and a single car and a single battery. So if it continues to evolve like this, um, I hope the next decade or so, we're gonna have uh, uh, equivalency of energy storage between fuel and um, batteries. And then we're gonna have flying cars, planes, helicopters, everything that, um, that has a medium apart from rockets, uh, because you cannot <laughs> build an electric rocket that is to, by the laws of physics. Apart from rockets, you could go, um, everything could go electric and become much cheaper. So imagine a car that now weighs, let's say, uh, two tons. One ton is more or less the battery, almost half, 40%, half of the weight of the vehicle is battery. Imagine if this battery reduces by tenfold then the cars will be even cheaper, more powerful, better, more clean uh, for the environment, and so on. Absolutely, more efficient, can drive further on a charge. Um, again, the rising tide. Uh, so, when you look at the differences, the pit stop. Uh, I love that. I, I love that because uh, you know what I what I have in mind are the, the the team that descends on the car, and in less than a few seconds they're they're back on on the track uh and that's tires fuel everything um are there other differences in the race itself that people might not realize differences that are being introduced by um uh by you know autonomous racing uh or even formula e such as you know are they quicker lap times are they tighter lap times um in in formula e we i think the main difference to conventional motorsport is that because we started only six years ago, we could come up with a technical uh, regulation which was very cost efficient. And when you say that, uh, what does it really mean? It means that the manufacturers involved, they will get a lot of 
um, a, a lot of R&D done in racing, then transferred to the commercial vehicle, which was lacking in other sides of motorsport. And Formula E kind of uh, got this niche of electric powertrains and with the regulations, uh, the, the motors are evolving, the inverters, the, everything is evolving, but there was still a niche on motorsport to go for autonomous uh, technologies. And that's why RoboRace kind of filled this gap. So with Formula E, you're developing the powertrains. With RoboRace, we look at standard powertrains for everybody. So everybody has access to the same motors, same uh, battery. This is not to be developed, otherwise you're, you're focused on the, on the wrong things. And now competition is based on software. So the competition of RoboRace is based on each competition is different. It's not a traditional race. So you have different formats of racing, you have different um, ways of, comp uh, of doing the competition, even with augmented reality. With um, you, you can do anything. You, you can go really crazy. You could eventually, for example, um, pour, you can put on, uh, on, on the racetrack virtual people, trucks, and cars, and the racing car has to go around them and complete the lap time in the best time possible. So it's not only the fact of going around the racetrack, which might not be very commercially relevant, but with, with augmented reality, with the software, we can actually come up with any kind of uh, uh, challenge that uh, in the end will have a commercial impact for the, the, the people involved. Absolutely. And I like the way that you put that just now, that the, um, the competition comes down to the software and and the algorithms so um you know bryn sitting in your seat as as chief strategy officer uh, this is bryn's no domain so if you're going to ask something about software please go <laughs> to bryn now don't don't <laughs> that, that's actually very good <laughs> all right cool we will uh i will I've, I've actually got a lot of questions about this so uh lucas you can uh you can put your feet up and <laughs> enjoy the next few minutes um, you know, Bryn, I, this is what one of the things that fascinates me about the model, the business model of Robo Race, is that you are um, competing on the algorithms, and then taking what we're learning and developing, and making that available to uh, uh, you know to a, a mass user audience, to to engineers everywhere, um, uh, in the open source communities. And yeah. uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I think it's, it's what's very unique about Rover Race, actually, in, in comparison to any motorsport that, you know, either me or Lucas have worked in. You know, I've been in Formula One, Lucas has been in Formula One, and e everything is a guarded secret. Everything that improves performance <laughs> is kind of hidden away and you don't talk about it. Yeah? And so it's very opaque, you know, even for engineers to kind of work out what's going on. Um, what we're actually doing in Rover Race is we provide the platform the teams are the ones that then bring the AI algorithms. So, you know, I like to say they arrive and drive, you know, it's like plugging a USB stick in and then you can drive the car. It's not as simple as that, but that's kind of the, the aim. Normally it's a Docker image for those that care. Um, and what we're able to do then is that through our university partners, any software that they're developing, they want to write research papers about, they want to make it public. You know? So for the first time really in motorsport, all of the research that, say, Technical University of Munich have done has now been shared publicly. So you can go on and read. I think there's about 19 different papers. They have about seven uh, PhD students working on the project. Um, and all of that information is shared. The code is then all open source, so it's on GitHub. Um, and it, it's a great um, I think you mentioned it, it's like uh, um, rising tides for all boats. You know, that's kind of the approach that we're taking. The more information that's out there, that's shared, the more you can build upon that. Yeah. And that's really what the open source community gives you is that ability for people to say, okay, well, I'll take that bit and I'll integrate that, but I'll focus on development of something separate. Um, but we also, I was going to say, we also did some fantastic research with uh, the VW group. Uh, so particularly with uh, VW data lab in Munich, which is their AI specialist group and with Ital design in, uh, in Italy. Um, and they were using the Roborace platform. Um, to do let's say, research on AI algorithms. And the reason they're able to do that is because we provide that platform that's very easily accessible. And then you can just swap out different modules depending on, on which area of focus you want. So there was some work that was done on low-level torque vectoring. They could run their algorithms. 
when they when it wasn't when they didn't want to run that if they found a problem with that they could run our tool vectoring algorithm so it's very modular in the way that you can combine things together from different people and that really improves um, the rate that you can develop so you know, previously when we first started at road race you know we went through all of this pain you know of developing both the vehicle from scratch and the software architecture from scratch and everything was kind of if one part failed whether it was software or physical you can't test you can't move forward and very quickly we moved to that sort of modular architecture whereas actually yeah you can go back to the previous version and continue developing your other areas so one team of developers then goes off tries to fix their problem but it doesn't impact everybody else you know and i think that's really important with the, the architecture you choose yeah and the architecture is so key and the architecture also uh, the business model i should say reveals a lot about um the the priorities of the organization so everything being proprietary your priority is monetize 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 and um you know keep all the patents right yeah uh, it what i'm what i'm picking up just in this conversation with both of you is that the motivation at robo race is is really to improve the world um and uh you can say that in a mission statement but it's another thing to take key learnings from something as rigorous as uh, racing technology development and then just publish them and uh and allow them you know free license how can engineers access uh, the robo race platform if they want to adopt the technology and evaluate certain modules yeah so um the key things that we develop i think we so i mentioned it earlier technology talent and trust they're, they're the the three key areas that we're advancing you know that's that's dennis's aim you know is to develop uh, technology talent and the trust in the public um to build the trust you need public engagement so, you know, RoboRace's core focus is how do we build that public engagement? And that's what motorsport gives you is a competition and a conduit for that. Um, when you start to then look at the software and where the software is available, as I mentioned, uh, a number of our university partners have already published all of their code. Um, if you look at Technical U University of Munich and some of their research papers, uh, if you go to their GitHub, you'll find it all on there. Um, when um, teams join RoboRace, we then have an internal set of code that we're able to offer to them, which gives them a starting point um, that's shared privately with the teams, but then they can build their own frameworks on the top of that. Okay, this is and this is so great. Um, one more, one more for Bryn here, and then uh, <laughs> trying to go back and forth. The um, what sensor technologies you mentioned uh the technologies that are being sort of incorporated and integrated uh what sensor te technologies have been developed and uh how are you know how have teams uh been uh developing these techniques for sensor fusion and image processing and and that sort of thing yeah so on the on the on the base vehicle obviously it's a motorsport vehicle so there's a lot more instrumentation on the suspensions and the tires and the temperatures pressures and, and things like that that come in the motorsport domain so that's a great foundation for vehicle dynamics and that information um, above that you then have you know we run a, a gnss uh, imu system within the vehicle so that gives you positioning down to one centimeter when we're running in its most accurate <laughs> mode but it also wow. gives you the six degree of freedom you know uh, movement of the vehicle platform itself so again Normally, they're devices that are too big to run in motorsport, but within our domain, we can run them within RoboRace. So you're getting uh, highly accurate positioning data. That can really serve as a good ground truth um, as to where the other objects are. So we have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. We're able to share positioning information. Um, so you can actually, we can actually run competitions that don't rely on perception at all. You know, we can we can just use shared positioning information, and the vehicles will avoid each other um, naturally, effectively. Um, the level above that, Dave, that you're mentioning with the sensors, normally people then start to think about perception sensors, and that's a yeah. separate part of the software stack. Um, within Roborace, we run uh, radar, lidar, machine vision cameras, um, uh, uh, sonar sensors as well, ultrasonic sensors. Um, and you, it's a it's a combination of them that you really need to bring together to work in all different domains. You know? So, if you if you're 
racing in somewhere like Silverstone in the UK, which is a very wide open space, it's an old airfield, the GPS inertial system will work fantastically well there. Um, and you'll struggle to find localization accuracy that's better than that using the other sensors. Um, right. If you go to somewhere like um, Goodwood Festival of Speed, where we've done demonstrations for the last two years with Robocar and with DevBot, um, you'll find that you have huge tree canopies, you know, like tunnels that are made out of trees. And so your GNSS system just does not work in that environment. Right. So you have to rely upon your other sensors. And that's really where your LiDAR sensors come in to give you a uh, localization accuracy where your cameras come in to help you build the map and do segmentation between the track and the grass so you you, you know where the tarmac is you know where you should be staying um so it's a it's a real combination of all the sensors that you're bringing to life basically and that's where the sense of fusion becomes most valuable right and, and just and uh, just uh, just something in goodwood the first year that we did it which was 2018 um we were Nowhere, the car went kind of wobbly around and went up the hill. It was the first ever hill climb autonomously. Uh, it was pretty good. But uh, 2019, so last year, uh, the car finished position 44 of all competitors. And uh, it had a massive improvement and not using GPS-based localization, which is no. at the moment was key to the performance. So we had a lot of margin. So the performance of the car got like really big steps from one year to another. So I'm, I'm a bit yeah. afraid of the competition and I'm going to do this year with a car. Yeah, that was about 14 seconds quicker, one year to the next. And that, yeah. was, that was not hardware related. That's all software related. You know, that was the improvements that were made. It's just the confidence that you have in the localization, the confidence you have in your friction estimate and all yeah. of that you know, it is confidence. And it's interesting because you use those words and it relates directly to human drivers. You know, how much confidence do you have in the car and the feel of the car and how much can you push the car is exactly the same really in the, in, in the autonomous vehicle domain. Absolutely. And that's this, this rapid evolution. I mean, uh, at 14 seconds in a, in any kind of formula type setting. I mean, it feels like a lifetime and no, 14 uh, seconds in a long track is a lot in Goodwood. I think yeah. it's like 40 seconds or something like yeah, that. Exactly. It's, a 40 it's second huge. Hill. It's like 30%. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, massive. Uh, it was yeah. massive. As you could one year over the next. Um, yeah. and to get there, uh, it's, yeah, it's, you know, uh, you mentioned a lot of, you know, this was a, uh, kind of the, the success of some software developments, but, Across the board, obviously, this all counts as a very rugged environment for electronics, uh, automotive. Uh, what, what can you tell us about how these uh, autonomous vehicles, electrical vehicles, uh, are dealing with shock, vibration, debris, temperature, that sort of thing? I was, I was going to say, not, not very well in some instances. So, yeah. so it's actually quite a lot of the reliability issues that you have are really to do with the ruggedization of certain components. Um, and so think, you know, things like network switching, it, you know, is obviously common in the say, consumer domain, in the normal uh, office domain. Um, but for automotive, they're not that common, you know. So bringing all of that technology together, making sure that it's hardened is really important. Um, with LiDAR sensors, you know, we've experienced some issue with LiDAR sensors. But again, where we mount the LIDARs on a race car, they're very low down to the floor on the, on the, on the front wing, effectively, of the vehicle. Um, and when that hits a curb or when that hits the floor, the shock that goes through is, is significant. You know? So in, even in comparison to a normal road-going vehicle, you, know, you don't have the luxury of the nice soft suspension system where everything's mounted. You, know, mm. you actually want to keep the platform as rigid as possible. So we've definitely noticed that uh, motorsport is pushing the boundaries of some of these technologies beyond where they are currently with the automotive domain. Sure. And, and I would also say a lot of the technology is still, you know, we don't have mass deployment of fully autonomous vehicles, which actually means that some of the core components in those systems aren't, let's say, they're not, say, production grade. They're not automotive grade yet. You know, it's, it's research, it's development, it's prototyping. It's demonstrator vehicles, you know, it, it's, it's not at that level where, you know, the, the components themselves have been hardened for this type of environment. That's improving all the time. And we've definitely noticed that, you know, in the last four years, it's improved. 
but there's still some way to go. And it's the same with temperatures as well. Temperatures are massive, a massive issue, always a massive right. issue. You know, it yeah. kind of often overlooked. I was gonna. I was gonna compliment it so so people have a little bit of a reference of how complicated the the, the process of reliability is in those systems. Is imagine in a road car, normal, you never go over one g. One g of acceleration is pretty much the limit. In a let's say a fighter air, airplane, you go up to maybe ten g, ten times. Uh, when we test components for a racing car, we test them up to fifty g. If you think about 15, yeah. 15 G, you get unconscious, uh, yeah. and we test them up to peaks of 40 to 50 G, uh, the electronic components, because of the high vibrations, the high impact of curbs, the low suspension travel, they need to be reliable for uh, a much harder environment than, uh, than, than others. So LIDARs, for example, uh, solid state LIDARs was like a holy grail of, uh, autonomous vehicles for uh, for a long time, and the moving lighters we had, they are all breaking down because they were automotive grade, but not racing grade. So we, ah, we, okay. we so they, they were made for one G, maybe two G, maybe we tested at five, but not at seven, eight, or ten. So they so they kind of sooner or, or later they break down. So we had a lot of problems with that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it's a. Um... It was interesting. I think there was some uh, Formula One recently that had some issues with, with with tires, but certainly there was. There's been cases in the past where you have drivers that are picking up vibrations that are coming through the tires, and it hits a resonant frequency that matches with their eyes, and it means that they can't see as well. They oh. get actually blurry vision. So we've not we've not found that yet within the the sensor domain that we're working on, but for sure it's going to exist. Anytime you have something that can move. You're going to end up finding a resonant frequency at some point. Yeah, exactly. And then you know, and it's time to bring in the mechanical engineers. And you know, is there something <laughs> else we can do to dampen this? And the the um uh the the other thing that strikes me is when I think about like an NVIDIA GPU or some kind of you know a uh, really high power uh, AI engine, I I don't think of those as being placed in certainly an automotive setting, let alone you know the the demands of uh, of motorsports. Yeah, I mean the 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 original work, as you say, the GPU has become not just a gaming computer device. You know, a lot of the algorithms and acceleration of algorithms is all based upon GPUs. Normally, sitting in people's workstations, researchers' workstations underneath their desk. So the first way to bring those to life is to take the workstation and put it into the car. Uh, and that was really the first generation of all these autonomous vehicle systems were, you know, grab the workstation because that's where the algorithms are, stick them in the vehicle. Um, what NVIDIA realized very quickly is that that doesn't work. There's huge reliability issues around that. And so they've taken the core chips and they've created automotive grade uh, compute platforms. So yes, the, the underlying technology is the same, let's say, um, but what they're creating now is something specific for automotive. Um, and actually, there's very specific processing cores on there that are, again, automotive specific. Um, so it's been great to see that. And now, really, Dave, they're looking towards making that, um, you know, functionally safe, you know, moving up the sort of ASIL D, uh, up towards ASIL D on functional safety. Um, that's, their, that's their target. And you need wow. that, really. You need, you know, in some ways, you have to think about it like the compute inside the vehicle is like a data center. You know, it needs to meet certain certain standards effectively um, because you're going to run everything else on the top of it. And, and really, NVIDIA are, are, are making that foundation, creating that foundation for everybody else to run on top of. Hence the announcement they made with um, Mercedes not so long ago, you know, and that's for their new compute platform coming out 2024, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you're not only generating, you're processing so much data and you're processing it um, with very high stakes, you know, this isn't, oh, I got the blue screen of death. What an inconvenience. You know, this is, you know, going careening off into another, uh, car or something. Um, you're doing so much real time processing that, uh, I mean, this, this really is the, uh, the upper limit of what's achievable with electronics. I know that when I'm trying to do too many things too quickly on, um, you know, my workstation computer, I can, you know, I can cause the thing to sort of hiccup and, and get confused. Um, and, 
and, and but, it's really but remarkable. It serves, it serves the same for 5G technology. You need to have mm. the connectivity between cars. It can also, it can all, it, it cannot say just like, there is no signal here, I'm gonna do something else. It, of course it can, but on the safety side, the communication uh, is very important. So also serves the same example. It's not an inconvenience if, the, if you have a, a, a cloud-based map update that stops in the middle of the run or uh, somebody can hack your car and drive it somewhere else. So it needs to be bulletproof. We're talking about, of course, uh, humans, human lives. And from society aspect, cannot only be better than a human. If it's better than a human but has accidents, um, people will point the fingers at this, this and that. It can, yeah. it, even if it's already statistically better than a human, it, people will not accept it. It needs to be almost fail-proof. Um, to, to, to be fully accepted. The other day I read a, re a, a headline which was autonomous car involved in crash. And I look at the article and I start reading it and basically a driver missed the red light, crashed into another car, run over a, 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 another like a part of the road and hit an autonomous car which was standing still. And the headline <laughs> was the, the, the autonomous car got involved in a crash. I mean, of but this is, this is the perception. So it, it needs to be developed in a way that is bulletproof. That's why it will take longer than expected. And that's why there's so many crit critics about Tesla, how they're doing. By the way, they are developing their own uh, hardware to process a large amount of image because their autonomous is based on purely uh, computer vision. They want to do it without LIDARs to make it cheaper and uh, use more of their already existing data. Uh, and I think they will succeed because in the end, a human is nothing more than uh, also stereo vision processing. Uh, we don't have lidars and we're still capable of driving. So I think it's just a matter of evolving the technology to the right amount. And that's the underlying physics of what Elon Musk wants to do. Uh, yeah. Humans, I they have this and that's it. I think that's one of the key points they've actually, Lucas mentioned, yeah, we, we do have two eyes and that's incredibly limiting. But what that means is that our brains have become very, very good at prediction using very small amounts of information. So you, you can look, at, look down like on a junction, you can look, see the car, and then predict where that car is going to be. And you don't need to look at it anymore because you can accurately predict. You know, it's like at the moment, there's a hell of a lot of reliance still on having 360 degree perception, but it's real time perception. It's kind of like if you were a driver, you're doing this all the time. You know, you're, you're constantly looking around <laughs> but you're not doing the prediction. Yeah. And the prediction is the thing yeah. that you need in order to plan and navigate in the future. Yeah. And that's really what driving is all about. And in motorsport, predicting how your competitor is going to work in an open road environment, you know, there are rules, but the rules are very limited. You know, being able to then influence their behavior by your actions is the essence of racing. And, and that exists on the road. It exists, you know, if you're going into a roundabout in Europe or it exists going onto a freeway, slip roads on and off of freeways. All of that is a competitive environment where you need to be looking and predicting and then controlling other people's behavior by your actions. And motorsport is the ultimate, you know, a development area for that type of technology. And that's what we're beginning to see now. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're doing things instinctually. Uh, and that's why I like that we have professional, uh, not just professional drivers, but, you know, world champion, uh, uh, drivers, uh, participating in this, because as, as we know, artificial intelligence, the algorithms are only going to be as, uh, successful as the people developing it. They will have biases, uh, because humans uh, only have so much experience and we're all doing the best we can. We can hardly raise our own kids. Right. Most of us, let alone uh, uh, take care of something like uh, teaching technology. So uh, there will be uh, something of a natural selection uh, and evolution of of these types of algorithms of this AI. And what, what's your take on um, sort of the natural selectivity of of these algorithms, you know, improving them? Uh, who has who has a leg up? Who has the best lo localization techniques? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, before before bring actually answering the the question on a more technical basis, I, I I I slightly disagree with the point that the algorithm will be as good as the let's say as the drivers using as a reference. I think uh, if we manage to be successful enough and we manage to be good enough, 
the machine learning will be so good that will come up with driving strategies that humans cannot predict. The same as with, uh, let's say, the AlphaGo example with, uh, with, uh, with the British company behind it. Uh, I, I forgot the name yeah, now. DeepMind, uh, yeah. Deep correct. Yeah. Um, mm. So the same as AlphaGo, that the, 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 just by machine learning with nobody having any experience on the game of Go, the, the algorithm just managed to beat the, the god of the game, which was this Korean um, four or four to one and come up with strategies that humans never thought was possible before. Yeah. And I think on a strategy level in, a, in, a, in driving, uh, it could come a completely different strategy. So I could imagine in the future that you have a, let's say a scenario, the classic uh, AI scenario, you have one kid in one side and four people in another side, where do you turn? And the computer could come with crazy strategies, I don't know, spinning the car around or, you know, it, it doesn't, yeah. it, it could evolve into a, a, such a high grade capacity of control and creating their own strategies that we, we as human cannot, cannot predict. Like Brin said, we are, we have our, like you said, also we have our bias, we have our, our limitations, but it, if you extrapolate a hundred years from now, 200, I mean, we are going to be the same genetically speaking our part if we're going right. to do any genetic modification or neural link type of changes, but our brains yeah. are going to be essentially the same, but these machines, we are talking about maybe 20 years of 30 years of evolution. There was not even phones or uh, we are talking about uh, four, eight, six processors. Uh, imagine yeah. in another, um, <laughs> imagine another 30, 40, 50 years is like I said, it's just a matter of time. Hopefully my career, my career is already almost over. I'm 36. <laughs> I have a couple of more years that I can race professionally. So I'm super glad that I took the, the prime out of motorsport. But at one point, it will be much better than, than the humans. Uh, it will be a, a phase that will complement humans, especially if humans want to have fun. So what is the fun of sitting in a car that drives at itself at the crazy speeds? It would be fun. It would be like a roller coaster. But then complement your driving, maybe there is up more to it when you talk about um, the involvement with humans uh, and the machine. But um, there will be no limit to what the, um, the, the, the AI can do. And I'm very yeah. curious to know what, what this future uh, will bring. Yeah, there's awesome. some, great, some great research data that's come out from ETH Zurich and Sony AI over in, uh, over in Switzerland, um, where they use Gran Turismo Sport. Ah, I a, saw a, that. A I saw that. It was amazing. Yes. Yeah. It's like it's a competition where you had AI drive, drive the car and it beat 50,000 human drivers. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it was, awesome. in, it's incredible. It sits right at the top end of the bell curve. If you like of performance, so, you know, so just a right at the edge, basically. So you, you'd have to be, let's say an expert driver executing everything right to the limit all of the time. And then the feedback from their human reference driver was, I, I couldn't do that. You know, 99, well, I think it was like 999 times out of a thousand, I'd end up having a collision. You know, I'd be able to do yeah. it one. You know, and, and that's really the, the interesting thing. We haven't seen that in the physical domain. And, and I wouldn't underestimate how difficult it is to take that learning in a simulation environment and put it into the physical domain where you have so much more noise that humans are very good at dealing with at the moment. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end game, as Lucas is describing, if the AI is so good and it's got like the abundance of confidence that it needs to just drive on the limit all the time and executes it perfectly, um, it's going to be very hard for humans to beat that. But at that point, it becomes the best trainer that you could ever imagine because it knows right. exactly what is possible and what you can do. So if you're looking for future racing stars as they grow up, training with an AI system, they will end up perform be performing better than if they trained alone. You know? Yes, that, that's, that's perfect, Green. That's exactly on the point. And actually, the last time we, I drove the car against the, the, the computer in this track in France, I, I could look, the, the, I still beat the computer in pretty much every corner, but I started to see for the first time the computer doing something that I could look into the data and improve my own driving. Um, so when you have a... a, a let's say an AI driver coach will be able to see the maximum what this hardware can do. And then um, basically saying that, ah, I cannot get faster in that corner. 
you have a reference to say that or yeah. not. And yeah, now you don't. Weird. Now you just have the best driver or, an, or your teammate or the data from another day. But with, yeah. a, with, a, with an AI being perfect all the time, will be the perfect trainer. I, uh, th that's a very good analogy from Bryn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Lucas, uh, you go more than a couple laps in anything. I mean, the, the physical endurance and the, the physical condition that a human driver has to be in to sustain the number of laps that it takes to win a race is part of it. But we know that there is mind body coherence. And we also know that as your body fatigues, your chances of making a mistake, I'm a mountain biker and I understand that, um, the second I start feeling a little too physically taxed, that's when I'm going to take a lazy turn and, and hit a rock. And I do it all the time. <laughs> so um, in, in your case, it, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, that um, a human driver will feel fatigue. A human driver might get uh, understandably distracted by some kind of vibration, you know, and it only takes you 250 milliseconds to think, what is that? take your eye off something and not realize that there was actually a much bigger problem that just popped up over here. Um, you're, you're right. The, the algorithms can, um, uh, the algorithms will do better 10 times out of 10 because, uh, the electronics will not become fatigued. Uh, and, uh, and the and reaction therefore... time and the reaction time is so much faster. Mm. We have a, a yeah. neurological limit to transmit the processing the process information from our eyes to our brains and to send the, uh, the, the, the signal back to our muscles and contract them chemically and, 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 and give the input to the car. Uh, that takes about between 200 and 300 milliseconds, while with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with an electrical systems, we are talking the speed of light is the limitation, physically speaking. Um, and so it's almost incomparable in terms of reaction time. What will be very difficult and we'll still need to build a bigger de database is the prediction. So for example, if I'm driving against a driver, I know what the driver will do. I can predict stuff that AI will be only able to predict if he has the same amount of data that I have. Uh, so this type of creativity, um, uh, let's say instinct, what they say, uh, this will be a little bit later for the AI to master, but if you if you give the the, 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 the system the right data input, uh, if you let's say you're gonna compete against a driver that I know very well, uh, let's say I'm gonna compete against Lewis Hamilton, and I've raced with Lewis since from younger age, and I, I really did. Is we are about the same age, so we're racing go karts, Formula Three, uh, Formula yeah. Two together, Formula One together. So um, I know how he will behave. I know how we'll try to overtake. I know which corner, but you can take all the record images and, and videos from every single race of Lewis Hamilton from zero to now feed to an AI and the AI will predict what he will do be probably better than I do also. So the instinct that I have racing against somebody else also could be transferred to the AI. Uh, and you could do that with any driver or with hundreds of drivers with millions of data points. There, it's basically infinite. The, 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 that's why there is, it's, it's very, very hard to compare a, a general artificial intelligence in, in a sense with, the, with a human. We are limited to our lifespan and our brain capacities, which a cloud of millions of points of data, they are not. So it's just a matter of time until it also gets better also in this domain, which will be later than the, 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 the reaction, which will be prediction, but it will happen also. No, I think oh, right. Lucas, Lucas told me a story once about his experience at Le Mans. So it's an in endurance racing in Le Mans, and you have very long stints. And you know, I think, Lucas, you were saying towards the end of the long stints, you can see more variability in the lap time. The, yes, uh, the performance true. is still there, but it's the variability as you're passing traffic and the decision-making you know, that, that gets affected the most. It's almost like, sorry for the ridiculously lame analogy, but it's almost like laying down an engineered wood floor, where if, if you introduce that much of a gap in one plank, by the end of the room, your gap, you know, if you keep repeating that same error, it's the same thing when, when you're making, you know, slightly longer decision times, or maybe the words of your coach and your team 
reminding you that, hey, watch out for this guy, because as you recall, in those final laps, he likes to get really close and kind of edge people out. Maybe those words aren't as loud in your mind and you kind of forget about it for a second, whereas a machine, obviously, it's it's doing math and uh, and executing accordingly. Um, yeah. I look, I could talk about this all day. I can hear <laughs> in my head the, the CEO of uh, All About Circuits uh, telling me you have to let the audience ask questions. So um, I think uh, I think it's time to do that. Let's take a few questions from the All About Circuits community and, and the participants here. Um, and uh, by the way, if you are watching this and you have the good fortune to be with us live right now, you can submit your questions uh, in the chat widget. Um, we need to invent a better word than widget, but that's what it's called right now. Uh, put it in the chat widget and we'll do our best to uh, get them answered, uh, while we're in this session here. So, uh, let me just, let me just pull up, uh, the first few. And, um, this is from a gentleman, presumably named Rodolfo. I think that's a safe bet. Uh, okay. So every, this is, this is the kind of the high level question that I think everybody wants to ask, uh, Posed to both of you, um, how far uh, are we away from having AI-driven cars replacing uh, the the current technology we have available, and what does that mean um, to a racing driver um, of the future? Uh, meaning the the kids who maybe would have started in go kart racing. What do you think that evolution of the driver looks like? Um. Yes. Um. Predicting uh, some um, anything for the future is very very tricky and normally tends to be wrong. So I, I don't want to say, but with precision, but I would say uh, I would say which is a conservative estimate, but less than twenty years from now there will be already a, a full replacement for for human drivers in, in any condition and any any situation or most of the situations, most of the conditions. Um, and the future of motorsport, in my opinion, does not look great. It looks uh, for me that motorsport will still exist, but the analogy that I always use is horse racing. Uh, well, everybody needed to ride horses. Horse racing was live on TV, it was a huge sport everywhere. There was races everywhere all the time. Now, yeah. horse races, they leave because of bets. And there is maybe one or two events which are, or three, four events worldwide, which are very, still very good. And still people expend a lot of money in horses. They still like it. But you don't need to know how to ride a horse to go to the supermarket or to, to live in society uh, yeah. anymore. Uh, you used to need a, to ride a horse to go to another town uh, 100 right. years ago, 130 years ago, but now not anymore. So I think with the driving will be similar. Mike. Actually, my younger cousins now already, they don't, they, they take longer to take the driving license because, again, it's a, it's a liability for them. They cannot drink and go out. They cannot, they have to buy a car. They have to have a responsibility. So they don't want that. They use mobility as a service. They call an Uber. It's all good. It's common sense between the new guys. There is not that social need of owning a car like we had, at least I was counting the days like a prisoner, you know, uh, to, to get my driving <laughs> license to, to own my own car because I wanted to go out with that girl and, you know, right. by having your own car and picking her up at home was the, let's say, the freedom status that everybody dreamed of. And it's not the case yeah. anymore. So society evolves. The perception of younger generation also changes. We have to we have, to have this in mind. We, we, we cannot use our own references to say the future will look like this because it was like that in the past. So we need to kind of get this social need. So for me, uh, less people driving be means less affection for motorsport. So less fans, which is already kind of showing up in data that uh, it's more of our older generation, younger, they're not engaging so much. Um, and uh, But it still will exist. Still, if you are the best driver of the world, you'll be able to be professional, make a lot of money. This would, still, people will put money into that because it will be fun. It is a fun hobby there's a lot of adrenaline uh the, the cost tendencies to go lower with the electrification so it, it will still exist but um, not as the way that we see today interesting yeah interesting. i think one of the things lucas mentioned if you if you take the horse racing analogy 
um, the role of the trainer in developing the horse and the passion that they put into that, you're going to see the same for the people developing the AI algorithms. You know, the sort of breeding sure. and training of these algorithms and bringing them to the track is, a, is an essential role. And, you know, whenever a horse wins a race, the trainer is one of the people who get recognized as well as the horse and as well as the jockey. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you can kind of look at, you know, if you took a stables analogy of that trainer, you, you'll see multiple AIs coming out of one place, you know, for sure. And they'll drive different vehicles. Um, I think what we're seeing is at the moment, especially post COVID is a shift towards, um, let's say mobility, but focused around uh, goods and goods delivery a little bit more so than people, you know, so we're kind of moving towards that, uh, a different application, if you like, of the autonomous technology. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I think, you know, let's say in the next 10 years, uh, we're going to move a lot further than where we are now. You know, there are deployed services that exist now, but on a, you know, a, a city level or actually smaller than a city level, like a, you know, a retirement home kind of commune level. Um, they, will, they will expand, you know, that's the plan. Start in a limited operational design domain and then expand out as you learn. Um, it will be the same in motorsport. It's a confined operational design domain. You know, I do definitely think, you know, we'll expand out of racetracks and into sort of the rally environments and the sort of more organic environments that are much harder to drive on. Um, that will definitely happen. And I think if you look back at motorsport, I'd say the last 10 years, which Lucas was key in, uh, in pushing forward, has all been about electrification of the powertrain within motorsport. You know, that's where all the innovation happens. That's where the push for the new technology happened. And a lot of championships now are rolling out electrical technology, but it's all been defined in the last, in the last 10 years. This 10 years of innovation is all around AI and robotics technology and how that impacts motorsport in the ways that you know, Lucas and I have described today. So it's going to be, for me, technology-wise, it's going to be the most fascinating era of motorsport this next 10 years. it would be amazing. Yep, this this will be an exciting. Um, it's an exciting era to be alive in, to, to because it's this inflection point that we get to yeah. witness. Um, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, I, I, I think it's cool. Um, so, uh, do you? I know that uh, we are officially. I'm officially on borrowed time <laughs> now. I've used up too much of your time. Uh, are either of you okay going another, say, five minutes to answer two more questions? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. All right. That's, that's, an, if I were doing my job better and I'm not a journalist, I'm just a, uh, an engineer, but if, if I were doing my job better, we would have finished by now. <laughs> uh, this is coming from uh, a young woman uh, named Min Lee and she is in Carroll stream, Illinois. And um, she, uh, she asks this, speaking of looking ahead to the future, um, she notes that uh, oh, I didn't know this, Lucas, you are a um, United Nations ambassador for the environment. And, um, uh, you, you took a, a, a race car to the, uh, North pole, to the ice cap, to draw attention to ice melting. Um, and apparently recently there was a study announced that, uh, the ice in Greenland, um, is at a point of no return in terms of melting, you know, winter snow, uh, as I understand it is no longer able to, uh, replace the ice cap that we lose, uh, in the summer. Um, as, as an ambassador, uh, on on environmental concerns tell us about that project a little bit and um about the 2016 project and you know how do you feel about this recent news uh, what what can communities be doing our generation our kids generation what what can we be doing to uh to help uh, slow this down um yeah so i'm gonna tell the story about the, this crazy project that we went to the arctic with the race car and then probably say something that I never said before, and uh, maybe I should have, I should should not say. But anyway, it's passed already. So the plan was to go with the Formula E car in 2016 and drive on top of an iceberg, not on the not on the uh, uh, Arctic Circle yeah. um, place that we 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 did do the the the, the let's say the challenge. Uh, the the idea was on an iceberg and. We hired this specialist to look for the best iceberg because you need to be kind of flat to be able to, to drive a racing car and the car needs to be like airlifted by helicopter. And so yeah. we chose, they chose this specific iceberg and, you know, very big iceberg, like, I don't know, 
100 meters by 100 meters, 100 meters by 200 meters, huge piece of flat <laughs> ice. And uh, this is a stable one. It doesn't break because if the iceberg breaks, it, it normally it, it melts to a point that it gets unstable and then it breaks and goes upside down. Yeah. Um, and all good. They spent a week on the iceberg flattening the surface for us to do it. So I took the plane. I flew to Iceland, took the plane, uh, a small plane, uh, to a place called Kolosuk, which uh, didn't have any, basically 400 people. The, we landed on the runway, and everybody from the plane had backpacks, and I had my suitcase that would roll, yeah? And uh, there was, everybody was looking at this, who's this idiot with this uh, with the suitcase that rolls? And uh, as soon as we landed, there was nothing. There was this small shed of wood with the plane, and basically gravel all the way to the hotel, and there was no cars. So I had to walk. <laughs> So I had to pick my bag, yeah. walk to the hotel. We arrive in the hotel. Uh, we need autonomous bags, by the way. No, but in this case, in the middle of Greenland with the, the, the gravel, yeah. you need maybe wheels this big, but was not the, it doesn't right. really work that, like that. So anyway, backpack would have been much more efficient. Then yeah. I arrived there, and then on the day that we're supposed to drive, at night, the iceberg breaks and flips. Ah. Oh. So if it would have been oh, a few hours later, and we're talking about time frames of years of that iceberg to be on that state, and exactly on that night, it broke down and flipped. If we were on top of it, we would have been dead, everybody. So, uh, oh, and man. then we decided, said, look, this is crazy. The, the expert was freaking out. Say, I don't do this anymore. This is too dangerous. <laughs> I cannot. And so we were there and we're like, what do we do? And then we... <laughs> flew with a helicopter to a place which was about 40 minutes away and we had to take the car there. And um, the pilot of the helicopter was a crazy, completely crazy ex-army guy. He said, no, I can take the car there, but I need to do refueling in the middle of it. And I was like, refueling where? <laughs> there is nothing. Is the Arctic Circle? There is nothing. There was nothing there between the place that we needed to take the car on, the, on this place that we found and uh, where the car was near the hotel. And I said, no, no, yeah. no, I will do it. Um, I will take manually a barrel of kerosene, fly it the night before or the day before or the afternoon before, yeah. drop this barrel in the middle of the way with a manual pump, go with the car halfway, drop the car in the middle of nowhere, refuel yeah. manually the helicopter, <laughs> And then take the car to that place. And we were like, what? <laughs> and because the, the helicopter could not take the load of the car with a full fuel tank or there was something around that. Anyway, the, the helicopter took the car there, then pick, came back to pick us up. We went there. Um, and we had, a, we had a rifle with us because there was a, there was a high probability that a polar bear could appear. And we were in the middle of the, 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 the Arctic Circle with nothing. The closest village from the place that we did that filming was a seven hour walk. walk. So if that helicopter had any mechanical problem, the helicopter, if there was too much wind for the helicopter to fly off, we would have to walk through crevices seven hours to the next village to be able to take a boat or something which was there so yeah. i and i had my overall and my racing boots when i realized that that was the case <laughs> and i was already there so the, the oh. helicopter took the car there and we were there yeah. waiting me and alejandro and the other guys and they couldn't hear the car because we went first uh, we went first the car was going to come later and uh, we could not hear and then suddenly we hear the, ta -ta 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 -ta, the helicopter brought the car we did uh, the, 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 and it was so rough that the car was breaking down in pieces, the <laughs> wings, everything was, uh, oh, was crazy. Really? So, yeah, yeah, because it was super rough that we could not have time to yeah. do anything. So the racing cars yeah. are not made to go in rough surfaces. But anyway, <laughs> and they said, look, you have a limit. You can drive only up to this point because over there, there's a huge crevices. We don't, you don't want to go there. And, you know, you could hear, and we were there standing on the ice. Oh, Jeez. You could you could hear the the the, the water melting. Actually, it was very oh, impressive. <laughs> when we were coming with a helicopter, yeah. when people say about 
the polar ice cap. You think about like snow from when you go skiing somewhere. But there, there was this white that would raise from the ocean level up to where you could not see anymore of a pure solid block of ice extending for thousands of kilometers. And the block of ice was three kilometers thick. So uh. we're talking about thousands of kilometers and, and 3,000 meters thick block of ice melting. Yeah. It's not a little bit. It's a lot, and you lose the notion because the sky was white, the block was the, the ice of the Greenland was white, so you didn't know where the ice finished and the sky started. <laughs> and then we were there, and when we landed, because we were on the edge, on the let's say on the downside of the, the, the cap, there was rivers and rivers of stream of water um, melting and coming down. And while yeah. you were there, you could hear this noise like. Rrr of the water underneath us uh, yeah. there and like huge lakes and stuff. It was complete. It really opened my mind of what yeah. really is going on when they say like the, the ice is melting. Uh, before you think ice is melting, okay, the ice is melting from the cup, you know, I, it's, snow is melting when it goes summer, but it's something which is extraordinary big and, and really impressive. But anyway, I was it's, there. It's almost, it's almost as if like a, a continent or a mountainside is eroding, but a very important continent and a very Correct. important mountainside. And side. then I saw yeah. the, I, and then I went there and I walked. I talked to people. Anyway, I, I saw it for the, I saw the icebergs for the first time in my life, and after that, I, I said, "Look, we it makes a lot of sense of what we're doing." Um, um, but when you talk about electric cars, people. They don't realize because it's such a long time frame. You say, oh, it's going to be without any ice in 100 years. And then people say, okay, 100 years. I don't know what I'm going to do next season. You know, people yeah. don't really know. It, it's, the, our brains are not really uh, tuned to work in such a big time frames and such a global, something with a, such a global impact. So you say, I'm not, it's not my fault. There's another 8 billion people doing it. I'm not going to do anything also because I'm, I, I don't count in this, in this process. So, right. the, so, the, so the approach I, I took with the UN was something which is much closer to us, which is air pollution. Uh, you can argue, like Brin said in the beginning, you can argue how the electricity is being generated for the electric cars. If it's generated by coal, it's really bad because it's still burning a lot of, still putting a lot of CO2 to, to charge the car, so it makes no sense. But one thing you cannot argue is that in, this, in the dense um, uh, city centers, urban areas, um, there is a huge, you, each human has a huge intake of pollutants coming yeah. mainly, uh, especially outdoor air pollution. So outdoor, indoor air pollution, people get, make fires in developing countries to cook and so on. That's the main yeah. source of death. But in, in developed countries and outdoor air pollutions are cars and trucks, especially trucks and logistics. And now it delivers even more. And uh, so any type of transportation, it's really, really impacting our health. And it's, it's, it's killing more people than COVID every year for many years. So the attention that we have for this topic is very little compared to the damage. And I did a documentary in India as well to check on that. And nine out of 10 children that now are born in Delhi, they have already a chronic uh, pulmonary disease uh, because of pollution uh, in the US. 65% of the hours lost to sickness is somehow related to air pollution, even with the asthma or some other kind of um, uh, heart or pulmonary disease. I did a little bit of research about this. So yeah. I decided to focus on clean air. I said, look, electric cars in the middle of cities, they do low mileage, so there is no range of anxiety. They don't pollute. You can say biofuel this, biofuel that, but in the end, if you emit gases where people live, you're breathing them, it's bad for health, has a huge impact on the pocket of the state because you have to take care of people with healthcare, has a huge impact on people's health. So I guess this is much easier to communicate. And that's what I did uh, with UN. So the focus is on clean air, uh, is on uh, electric vehicles on this specific topic. Brilliant, good for you. And, and thank you for, for your efforts in this because uh, you know we, 
nobody's uh, nobody will be unaffected uh, by things like this. And, uh, you know, as we get more and more smart cities and we're adopting more of those types of platforms, uh, we are able to collect more and more real data about air quality. And hopefully when that data gets published, uh, a lot more attention can be drawn to it with with factual citations uh, in what's being published. And um, that's uh, it is it is a very sobering um, uh, problem to solve. But again, hopefully we are living in a, in a time where we are at an inflection point and, um, you know, we are engineering cleaner solutions, at least. Um, and but it, it begs a follow up question. You're you're married. Does your wife. Does your wife ever wonder, like, slow down? You know, it's not enough to be driving 200 miles an hour, three wide. Now you have to go and fight polar bears and drive through splitting ice and ice rivers. And else. Uh, uh, you're a. <laughs> I appreciate the question. And uh, yeah, well, she, she didn't know, but actually, she, did, she doesn't know the full story. <laughs> I think she will. She will. Uh, she's probably <laughs> listening from the from in the living room there, and I'm gonna get some some some. Oh no! Yeah, but oh, now no. I have a kid. Um, um, I have a, a two year old kid, and uh, I'm actually choosing now what I what, what I take my risks because you cannot just take crazy risks all the time. Of course, as a racing driver, you're already committed to some risks, but I'm trying to be <laughs> a little bit more. Uh, um, uh, let's say uh, less crazy on these topics, but uh, uh, it doesn't still doesn't compare. Motorsport is very safe. We're just trying to make yeah. it safer, and um, yeah. uh, it is it is a profession that I love, and I'm trying to use it to turn into a uh, turn and to use that knowledge and that know how and that network and that public access to turn the world of mobility into a better place. That's what I always wanted to do, and um, I have great people around me, like Brin, like Dennis, like Agag, the founder of Forma E and Extreme E. I'm launching now, uh, I, I actually I launched a month ago an electric mo uh, micro-mobility world championship called ESC, so Electric Scooter Championship. We, we are producing this extremely fast electric scooter. We're going to do a race around the world, a championship, um, to also promote safety in micro-mobility because in the end, it's much more dangerous to, to ride a scooter in a urban area at 30 kph without a helmet than to drive a race car in a in a in a prepared yeah. environment in a, in a in a prepared way. So it doesn't really matter if we develop all of these with robo race and then people are just going crazy with the electric scooter that they hire and then they race and then they they have yeah. uh, traumas. Right. So yeah. it's all it's all, all uh, a lot of work, but for a good cause. It's. It's it's great to be in a position where you can be an amb uh, an ambassador not only for the sport for the industry but uh, also for the causes that that uh, improve all of our quality of life collectively. Hopefully, a little bit already will help. Absolutely. Uh, well, guys, Bryn, is there anything you wanted to add before I uh, I'm 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 now getting I should show you my phone, but I'm getting text after text like. <laughs> no. wrap it up so i better, <laughs> no, no. I better let good. you guys have your your lives back um yeah no it's but, been really uh, great to talk to you though. oh the believe me the 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 pleasure has been all mine and um that's uh this has been so much fun unfortunately we are out of time and um you know i could not have enjoyed this conversation any more than i have uh lucas Bryn, thank you so much for joining me and um I have decided that uh, even though uh, you, you didn't offer, I will take you up, Lucas, on on a uh, on an offer to take me for a few laps around the track the next time uh, we see. <laughs> no, next time we're gonna put you in, your, yourself in the the autonomous car because it fits in the in the in the dev bot. We can put a human there, and the car will drive you around the racetrack at uh, racing speeds. I love it. <laughs> that, we will that's, put that's <laughs> most that's the most scary thing you can do at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm a control freak, so I. I love the idea that we're putting my money where your mouth is. I, I I'm totally <laughs> in for that, and I trust you. I I wouldn't do that with anybody uh, else. Trust but I, Brain. Trust Brain. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the mastermind behind it. Uh, you're, you're good. You'll be good. Thing. <laughs> I feel totally safe. Um, no, <laughs> I'll have my people call your people. Uh, and and those of you watching this at home or at work, remember um, this week Industry Tech Days. It's your week to take advantage of what like fifty live sessions uh, with the leaders in our industry and we start at 9 a.m eastern every day and you can join us live or on demand uh, for all of these sessions throughout the week at allaboutcircuits.com 
Uh, hey, thanks, guys. I've got metal. Thank you very much. 